We are going to continue with plotting now. We are about half an hour behind schedule, uh, but I had half an hour at the end for Q&A, so I think if we keep at the pace we're going, we'll get through the material. Um, so, plotting. We're going to be talking about a tidyverse package, which is called ggplot2, or ggplot for short. What is ggplot? So this is a modern system for data visualization, and it, GG stands for Grammar of Graphics. It's going to be a way where we create plots by taking individual layers of plots and stacking them on top of each other to create an output. So here is an example of some ggplot code, as well as the output, and kind of the mental model for this is going to be, we call ggplot at the top. That's going to create the bottom layer of our, our axes. And then the next line is geom line. We're going to create a line here. That is the second layer. We're going to do point. That is the third layer. We're going to do another line that is colored red. That is the final layer. And it will be stacked on top of each other to give us our final output. So this is really how we want to think about building ggplots. And it is important to notice that the order here does matter. You're stacking them on top of each other. So if you have stuff that overlaps, the, the one that's furthest on top is going to be shown. So there are different elements of a ggplot. So you have data, which you are going to be using. You have aesthetics, and these control things like the color, the shape, the size, all that, as well as your x and y axes. You have different types of geometries, and these are the types of elements that you can show your data using. Think box plot, lines, points. These are all geometries. There are different ways that you can size your axes and your coordinate system using the scales functionality. There are statistical transformations that you can use to derive some new output that is plotted and there's additional customizations that you can use with the theme functionality. This is a lot. I'm going to cover really how to just make spaghetti plots and box plots today. But ggplot does a lot. Thankfully, our studio, now Posit, creates these cheat sheets. They're available um, all over the, the web pages. I like to go to this github.io and then cheat sheets, and it lists it for all of the different tidyverse packages, ggplot being one of them. I literally have this printed out on my desk. I grab this all the time to look at it. I don't remember the syntax. I don't remember you know, what shape corresponds to what number. There's nothing wrong with Googling. There's nothing wrong with having cheat sheets. No one remembers all this stuff. We all, you know, you, no one expects you to know everything off the top of your head. So don't, don't be afraid of a cheat sheet. Pardon? Sure. <laughs> okay, so now we're going to go through and try and build a ggplot. So data is an argument to ggplot. So you start out any plot by calling ggplot. Say what data set you want to use. And then you're going to have an aesthetics call. And we're going to say on our x-axis, we want time. On our y-axis, we want concentrations. These names correspond to columns in our data set. So you can see the, call, the data set that we're using, the Theophylline data set again on the bottom here. So the name of the object is Theoph. And we have named columns time and concentration. That will give us a blank graph with labeled axes. So that's nice. We are, uh, you can see my, my bottom of this, can you? Well, the x-axis is, is labeled, I promise. Um, yeah, no problem. So now we want to add stuff on this. Remember, it's a layering. We're going to layer, layer, layer. Oh, was it because I didn't look at the chat on that one? Yep, yep, no worries. Perfect, thank you. Okay, so now we want to have a, some points included on here. So we're going to use the plus operator 
and then the point geometry, geom underscore point. So it's going to create a dot plot for you that has all of the values from your data set. It's going to plot time on X, concentration on Y. So perfect, it's beautiful. Let's add some other stuff to it. How about we want each point that is contributed by a subject to be colored differently? So we can add to the aesthetic call, color equals subject. So it's going to look in the subject column. Every, every instance where subject is equal to six is going to be, what is that, purple? Yeah. On our right-hand side now, it has automatic, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, that's wonderful. On our right-hand side now, we can see it has added a legend, which shows the color for each of the subjects. Very nice. And we just, we keep, we keep building. You can layer on top of each other. So next, we're going to look at adding a smooth line. We're lagging. We're lagging behind a little bit. There we go. So we're going to add a smooth line. So the geom smooth adds a smooth curve through all of the points because we're saying color by subject it's going to inherit into all of the geometries below and it's going to also for for both point and smooth assign the same color for each of for the subject individually so you can see our legend has also changed now it shows that there is a point and a line through it and the point and the line are the same color uh, for each subject, for each individual. We're also putting a additional argument in here, SE equals false, so that's standard error. By default, it will show you the standard error around your smooth. This is just to kind of show you there's a lot of options in each of these geometries, and you just pass in arguments as you would with any other function. And again, those cheat sheets are super helpful. Looking at the documentation in our studio, you know, question geom underscore smooth will pop up and tell you what's required, what are the defaults for the arguments, what, what arguments are available. And a lot, of, a lot of these geometries will share the same names. Um, so, so color is kind of shared amongst all of them. Size is shared amongst a lot of them. So we can also overwrite some of these aesthetic properties. So maybe we don't want an individual line for all of the subjects. So we can instead say, for the smooth call, for the aesthetic specific to smooth, we're going to use null. And null means like turn it off in R, like it doesn't exist. So instead of inheriting color equals subject, we're going to overwrite it here and say color equals null. And so it will, instead of creating an, a line individual for each subject, it will now have one single line that averages across all of the subjects. We can also do the opposite here, where we don't, you don't have to assign your aesthetics up in the ggplot call. You can create individual aesthetics for each of your geometries. So you could say, Geom point, aesthetics, time, concentration, subject, geometry, smooth, aesthetics, time, concentration, that's all. Uh, we'll kind of, I'll, I'll show a little bit more of that in the hands-on. Okay, so instead of a smooth, maybe we want a line plot. But now, it's not doing what I want it to do. It is just going from left to right and kind of playing connect the dots. And so that's, that's not what I was hoping to show. So you can introduce this grouping function. So we want to say there is a group variable that exists. We want to group together all rows that share the same subject. And so what this does now, we have an individual line for each of subjects here. We're not coloring, we're just grouping them together so the lines follow the points. Notice that this is different from smooth. Smooth was doing an average. This is connecting each of your dots. That's the difference between geom smooth, geom line.
You can also create an object and save it. So we're creating this concentration underscore time with our line. And when you type in concentration underscore time, it shows it. Very nice. We can also add on to the object that it was assigned to. So we can say concentration underscore time. We also want to add log scale for the y-axis. And we want to add a label to the y-axis concentration. You can see the difference here. We're not assign we you can assign this to a new uh, variable as well, concentration underscore time underscore log, if you want to do that. Or you can just display these separately, like I'm doing here. So trying to think about when we're building these, it's really important to remember that the order matters with what shows up at the end. So on the left-hand side, I have point shown first, line shown second. On the right-hand side, I have line shown first, point shown second. And you can't really see on the projector, but the red dots are visible on the right-hand side, but not on the left-hand side. And that's because on the left-hand side, they're being covered up by the line. So point is added, line is added. You can't see it anymore. So really important to think about the order that you're making these calls. You can swap the lines, and it can change how your plot turns out. Also notice here, I'm not using the AES function when I'm creating the color or the size. So you use AES when you want a value to be mapped to a column in your data set. If it's not in your data set, you don't put it inside AES. So I'm hard coding in and saying color equals red for all points. I'm not saying color it by subject. If I was coloring it, Based on the values within a column in the data set, it would go inside the AES call. If you are not using your data set to determine that aesthetic, you do not need to put it in AES. And it will yell at you if you put it inside AES. OK, so another way that we may want to display data is through faceting. We want to have. This line plot, we have male and female subjects in here, but we want to plot them separately. So you could color them separately and have them on the same plot. Or you can use this facet. So facet underscore wrap will create plots next to each other. And at the top, the left one says female, the right one says male. So all of the female subjects are on the left plot, male are on the right plot. And those are the two options that we have inside that gender column. It's important to know that the facets will be displayed in alphabetical order unless they're factors. So if you want the facets to show up in a certain order, you need to use factors. This is important for dose. If, for example, you have a 0 0.5 milligram dose, 2.5 milligram dose, and a 10 milligram dose, it's going to put those in alphabetical order. 0, 1, 2, 0 0.5, 10, 2.5. That's not, it doesn't put it in numeric order for you. It'll come up in the hands on. I'm using facet wrap here. There also exists a facet grid where you can facet by multiple variables, both rows and columns. So you don't have to just facet by one variable. So you can look into that if you're interested. There's some stuff in the backups on how to use that. So those are spaghetti plots. That's how we build them. We're going to go over to box plots now. Similar sort of thing. We're going to have data. We're going to have a ggplot call. We're going to say what our x and y are. And then we're going to call geom box plot. If I just call geom box plot, it's not going to give me what I want. This is not what I would expect to see. So we need to think about our grouping elements. And these are important for box plots, making sure that we're creating separate box plots for different groups. You'll also notice the second line in our pipe, group by ID, slice one, ungroup. Does anybody want to guess what that line does and why I put it there? Okay. 
Yes. Oh, okay. The question again, I cannot. I did. What the question? Yeah, the question was this second line that's in green: group by ID, slice one, ungroup. You want to guess what it does and why I put it there? No, that's okay. Okay, so the data set that we are using here, uh, there are multiple lines per ID. And when we are creating a box plot such as this, where we're looking at the weight versus dose, we want to have each, um, each subject only represented once. It is possible that in your data set, you have 20 observations from one subject, five from another subject. If you don't collapse the data set down to one row per subject, you're not going to get a box plot that's accurately representing your data because you're inflating it, it's weighted based on how many observations there are in the data set for each subject. So what this does, we're going to group by each individual ID. Slice one will just take the first row for each subject. And then we're going to ungroup because we don't want to apply functions only to that group moving forward. But we get after running that second line is a data set where we have one row per subject and it has retained all of the columns. And then we're feeding it in to the ggplot. So how can we fix this box plot? Thankfully, a lot of times, ggplot will give you a meaningful warning. Uh, when we were doing the hands-on, I think a lot of people were getting errors. That's totally natural. The errors have varying amount of helpfulness. Sometimes the error message is very clear and will tell you, you know, did you forget group equals? That's very explicit, tells you what you should try to fix it. Other times, it's very vague. Um, if you can't figure out what it says, I'd recommend copy that line, Google it. Someone on Stack Overflow has had the same problem as you. They can help you. If they can't help you, email me, you all have my emails. So. Let's add a group variable and see how it looks now. So we have added to our aesthetics call on the third line at the top, group equals dose. So this is getting closer to what we want. Now we have an individual box plot for each of the dose levels, but they look kind of, they're spaced funny. This is because it's treating the x-axis as a continuous variable right now. So it's putting it at the spot where it is I don't really want that. I want them all to be even, pushed together, and looking nice. So why don't we try typecasting our dose column from numeric to character? So I am using as.characterDose now instead of just dose. And we're, our spacing is fixed. But again, it's in the wrong order. Remember what I was talking about. It, we'll put them in alphabetical order here. So if you look along the bottom. 0.5, 10, 2.5, 25. That's not what we want. So use, converting it just to a character will not fix our problem for us. But we're getting closer. Also, can note that the group is no longer required when x is a character or factor. You can keep it in for now. It's not going to do anything. Um, you know, box plots are kind of funny. Sometimes you need group. Sometimes you don't need group. Really, you just kind of got to play with it and get used to depending on what, how you want your box plot to look, it's going to have different aesthetic requirements. And you'll see that as I add more stuff in here. OK, so now we're going to create a factor. We created this factor in the hands-on, so we can see factor dose. We've got the levels explicitly stated. And now on the bottom, we have our doses shown in the order that we want them to show. Wonderful. We have also added on a couple other elements. So we have labels for the x and y axis. So we have, rather than just having the column name, now we can have it human readable with units. That's nice to do. So you do that using labs. We also have used this theme underscore BW. You may have noticed that Emma used this yesterday during her demo. Look at the background of this plot. It is white. We go to the previous slide and we look at the background. It is gray. This is what theme does. It just changes 
the color pattern that it is being used on your plots. So if you want something to look a certain way, look in the theme. There's a lot of built-in themes. You can build your own themes. I like underscore black and white. That's just me. OK. So it looks good. Now we want to look at for different sexes, male and female. So we're going to add the fill element to the aesthetic. And now we're going to have colors separately for male and female. It's still going to be uh, above the corresponding dose. And we have a legend which has been added telling us what is colored female, what is colored male. We can move the theme to the bottom. It defaults to the right. But again, this theme is how you really set these, how it looks for your plots. And so I wanted to put it on the bottom. And I know that that exists because I looked on the cheat sheet and it said, move the legend to the bottom using this. Here are the options, top, bottom, left, right. Yeah, that's all I want to say. OK. So then you know, customizing these aesthetics, we kind of talked about it a little bit. But there's names for all of these. You know, There's title, breaks, labels, getting to know what each part of the ggplot is called will help you change the aesthetics. There's really good documentation online for this. Yeah, question in the back. For the box plot, can we add a horizontal line for the upper and lower fins? There Absolutely. Is, is there an option for this code? So a line for... Horizontal line for upper fins and lower fins. Uh, like on top of the yeah. vertical line? Yeah. Uh, there's yeah I think there is I don't know what it is off the top of my head. Sorry, somebody said it. Segment, right? Thank you. Yes, you can. We can we can talk about how to implement that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so so changing the aesthetics is really coming from you know adding these. We have scale. Uh, scaling the colors, adding breaks. I mean, there's a, there's a lot here that you can really customize and make your own to make the plot look how you want it to look. You can change what colors are being used. We can change how your axes are, how, you know, what the minimum maximum are, where it's adding the breaks. All of that is coming from here. So uh, just kind of looking into the documentation will help you figure out how to change these different elements. OK, so objects in ggplot, we think about them as layered in sequential order. And the first line in your ggplot is the bottom layer, and the last line is your top layer. The aesthetics can be inherited from the ggplot, or you can specify them for each of the individual geometries. Working with uh, grouping you know, will change how your plot looks. And you just got to think about what goes together. If I'm doing a line, I want a line for each of the subjects. Well, I will grouped by the subjects. And again, don't hesitate to Google this stuff. It's a lot of, a lot of the plots that you're going to want to put together, somebody has done before, and they have written a blog post on how they made their plot look the way that it does. So uh, you know, getting a basic understanding of how it works is good to start building plots. But really, to master it, it you, you're going to Google it a lot and just kind of figure out how to implement it yourself and learn by doing. So speaking of learn by doing, hands on number three, we're going to do some plots now. So does everybody have mad non mem imported into R at this point? If you do not, raise your hand. Me or one of the TAs will come over and make sure that it is loaded so that you can start plotting. So we have two plots that we could possibly do. Uh, first plot will be the box plot. Second plot will be a spaghetti plot. You can take a lot of the code that I showed you and make some small changes to it, and you'll, you'll be a lot of the way there. So do that. There's a challenge as well if anybody gets to it on the bottom. Let's do 20 minutes. So at the top of the hour, 3 o'clock, I will go and start walking through how I implemented the solution to this hands-on.
I will answer the question online as I'm going through the solutions for whoever asked the question.
if anyone needs parking validation, please go see Amelia out front. So do it now. We will convene in five minutes. Spoken. Ask questions or don't.
okay, we are going to go through the solutions and I don't think anybody got through all of these. So don't feel bad if you didn't get through them. This is, there's a lot here and there's a lot of stuff in the backups for you to explore when you have time. So I'm going to stop share and reshare my R. As such, we are hands on three. Okay, I'm gonna kind of go through this kind of quick because we're starting to run on short on time. We have about an hour left. I will send out these R script solutions. You guys can play with them. Email me questions. Yeah, if you if you don't if you don't absorb everything as I'm going through it right now, I do not expect you to. Yeah, is my mic on? I believe it is. Okay, thank you. Okay, so when I'm working in our studio and I'm popping between our scripts, you know, you're gonna have different libraries loaded in. You're gonna have different data sets loaded in. Something that I would really recommend when you switch over to a new script, you want to clear out your memory in R. You do that by going to session at the top, restart R. What that does, it will remove all of the objects that you've created, all of the packages you've loaded, and get you back to square one. It also means if you had set your working directory, it is no longer set. So you might need to do that again. And that is the benefit of using our project files because then it will put your working directory in the same position every time. Bit of an aside. Okay, so we're gonna, we've already loaded in the data set. We've gone through what that is. So first thing we wanna do is add these columns again that we created previously because we're going to use them for plotting. There's no change from the columns that we created previously. So to create our box plot, Remember, we want to collapse to one row per subject. So we're using that group by ID, slice one, ungroup pattern. We're going to then do ggplot and say the aesthetics, we want to have sex on the x-axis, age on the y-axis. We want to add a box plot. And we're going to add some labels so that they are human readable. So there's our output. We get female, male. And uh, remember the grouping, we talked about grouping is important sometimes, not all the times. This is one of the cases where because sex is of type character, it just automatically groups for you. So that's why we don't have a group in the aesthetic here. If you put in a group, I really don't think that it would make any change to the plot. Yeah, it's identical. You can, don't need it here. So second plot, a spaghetti plot colored by dose group and faceted by day. So for my facets, I wanted to make a nice label. So I'm using this paste function and creating a new variable. So if I just run this line and look at day uh, and print it to column. So it's going to take day is currently a numeric value one or 21, and it's going to create a new uh, column in the data set that has the word day, a space, and then the number that is in the all caps day column. I do this to make my facet look nice. You'll see why I do it when we put the plot up. So we're creating this new column. So in ggplot, we have the aesthetics, x, y, we're coloring by dose, we're grouping by ID because we want our lines to be connecting only an individual ID to itself. We're going to add points and lines. I want a log scale on the Y axis. And if I do that, if I just run that chunk, so if you are in, R, in an R script and you select a couple lines of code, and you run it, it will run that chunk of code for you. So if I just do that, we can see time is on the x-axis. We've got lines for each individual, and they're colored by dose. But it's really hard to see because of the length of time that's included here. So 
Thus, I am faceting by our new day variable. You can set the scales. We're going to have three x. So this means our x-axis will be scaled to the range of data that is included within that facet alone. And I want two rows for my plots to show up. I'm going to add some nice labels. And I'm going to move the legend to the bottom. So if we run this whole chunk of code, now we can see that we have day one printed at the top of the facet here. Zoom and make this bigger so it's easier to see. We have individual lines for each subject. We have what dose they are labeled. We don't have the subject labeled because we're coloring by dose. We have a line for each subject. We can see our x-axis on day one goes from zero to one. It's only looking at the first day. And then our x-axis on the bottom is looking at day 21 until the end of the data set. So we can see, hey, that looks weird. So there's probably an error in the data set. So you know, when you're doing data analysis, it's really important to look at the data because you'll see stuff like this. There's an error. Um, I will leave it to you all to figure out how to filter out or mutate that and make it look good. Um, but that is what I would do would be to add into my pipeline. I'm already mutating. So I would do some sort of dv equals if else, and then whatever, figure out how to find that error, fix it, or just remove it. So that's how I would fix a data error in my pipeline. OK, the challenge plot, I just said find the Cmax. If you're not a PK person, Cmax is the maximum concentration in for each uh, subject. So what I'm doing is I'm going to dose or group by ID. I also want to group by dose because I want that to be carried forward into my output from summarize because I'm not mutating, I'm summarizing. And then I'm going to say Cmax is just the max DV for each subject. If I run this chunk, the data set that is output has one line per ID. We have the dose that they have, and then the Cmax, which was calculated based on each individual subject. Now I feed that into the box plot. Y axis on the log scale. Here's a different theme option, minimal theme. And this is how the output looks. So this is how I would create a summary box plot from a larger data set. Again, thinking about doing data manipulation at the top, piping it into ggplot, adding your layers in order. That's how you're going to get there. Uh, you can see someone was asking about the, the AES and the data. So if I had a separate data set and I wanted to plot it together, you can add in here data equals cmaxes, and then look for these columns. And then I would have. A -E -A -A geome, I don't know, point. And I just want to use the inherited data. We'll use the same here. This, uh, this isn't going to work how I want it to look. Oh, here, here, here. We got it. So data equals plot dat. And then within that, we don't have a Cmax, but I just want to plot the DVs on the Y. And now if I run this, let's see if it worked. Doesn't, doesn't like that. Um, check aesthetics. Must be the same length. OK, it didn't work. OK, well, oh, oh, I see. I typed AES twice. Let's see if this works. I'll give up if it doesn't. There, OK. So one of the question online was, how can I plot multiple data sets at the same time? You do it by specifying the data within the geometry. So you can have multiple different data sets. So at the top here for ggplot, I'm setting the data set equal to this summarized version of plot dat because it's piped in. When it's set at ggplot, it is inherited all of the geometries within there unless you specify a new one. So I'm specifying a new one specifically for geome point. 
I'm saying don't use the summarized, use the original, look for these columns within plot dat, and that's how I'm able to incorporate multiple data sets into my plots. Hope that helped to answer the question that was online. Okay. Last lecture. We will now be talking about, where's my, here we go. Solution, solution. Okay, loops and functions. My recommendation, do not copy paste in your code. If you are doing something in your R script and you wanna do the same thing five times, it is very easy to select that chunk of code, copy, paste, make a small change, paste it again, make a different small change, all that. That is not how you wanna be writing your code. You're, it's hard to review. It's very easy to miss whatever small thing that you're trying to change, leave it how it was or something comes through. This is a way that you're really going to have errors leak into your code by doing this. So if I'm not copy pasting code, how do I do the same thing multiple times? Well, this is where functions come in. So we're gonna talk about how to write functions and how we can use them in R and it's going to allow your R scripts to be shorter easier to review, and it's, it will make your life easier if you understand how functions work in a workflow in R. When will I use this? You can write helper functions. If you are doing, um, what would you do? If you are importing data and you want to set the default to pull the header from the second row instead of the first. You can create your own function where the default is what you want it to be. You know, these, you can set defaults, you can combine two steps really easily to do something. These helper functions are a way of taking really common patterns in your code and packaging them together so that you can reuse them over and over. Same with repetitive workflows and running simulations, you're kind of doing the same thing over and over. And plotting, if you are creating the same type of plot over and over, but with different variables, for example, you, or different covariates, just create a function and then pass in the, the variables that you wanna do. So how do you write functions? It looks confusing, there's a lot here, but we're gonna just step through and it's pretty simple to do. So first we have the function name. So on the left-hand side of the assign, is what you're going to name your function. When you call your function on the bottom here, that is what you will, the name you will use to call your function. So then we're going to assign, and we're going to say this is a function, and then x is an argument. You can have multiple arguments. You can assign defaults for your arguments. Everything that you want to apply the function to should come in as an argument. And we have a little curly bracket, and that just tells you where the function begins and where it ends. So everything within those curly brackets are part of the function and are all going to be assigned to that. So we're doing a factorial. So we're going to use the product function. We're going to take a sequence from one to the value of x, the argument that is being given. We're going to go by one. We're going to store it in the object product, and then we were, are going to return product. So if we say my factorial, run it, and you give it three, it will calculate the factorial of three using this process. We should note product is created inside the function. You won't see it. You won't interact with it. If it is inside the function, it will not come out into your environment unless it is returned and it will be returned uh, as you store it. So you can create multiple variables within there and they will just disappear when the function's over unless you return them. This is called scoping. If it's inside those brackets, it's only available within those brackets. It's not available outside. Note, if the function name already exists in base R and you overwrite it, like if I had named this factorial, there is a factorial function built into R. If I write a factorial function and save it, it will overwrite the one that's in base R. 
you don't want to do that most of the time. So thinking about if, if a function already exists, you should name, have a unique name. This also stands for variables. I, I don't know if I explicitly mentioned this already, but like you, you can name a variable factorial, but there is also a function factorial and it can get really confusing. So think about naming and using comments and variable names as a way to communicate what you're trying to accomplish in your code. It's very tempting to have X be the name of your variable all the time. If you come back six months from now and look at your code and your variable is X and then you do a bunch of stuff and you turn it into Y and if, if you, you're not gonna know what it is. So why not say data as imported, data filtered. We, you use that as comments to document your code and what you're doing. Okay, so here's an example of two arguments. I said you can have multiple arguments. So now we're going to implement the choose function, X and Y. We're going to use our my factorial function that we just built. We're gonna calculate choose. So we're gonna do three choose two, it returns three. Looks like what I would expect to see. You'll notice return is not used in this function. If you don't use return explicitly, it will just return the last object that was output to the console within the function. So I'm not storing this, I'm just creating it and it's returning it automatically. I would say this is bad practice. You wanna be explicit with your code and say return this value. So I just did this as a bad example. Okay. Now I mentioned defaults. In red, we have a, the arguments for our function that we're creating. The function is called CI95. We're calculating a 95% confidence interval. So we're going to have, in addition to X, the vector that we want to calculate the quantiles on, we have a low Q function and a high Q function. And I'm using the equal sign here to assign a default value. So this means if no additional, if, if low Q and high Q are not provided in the function call, like they are here, it will default to those values. If I want those values to be overwritten, you just say low Q equals 0 0.05 instead, and it will overwrite it and do it for you. So then we're taking those arguments, passing them into the quantile function, and returning an object that has our two and a half, 97 and a half percentiles. Additionally, we have the ellipsis operator, dot, dot, dot. What this does, it allows you to pass arguments into internal functions without explicitly naming them. So you can see here, I'm passing names equals false in blue. Using the ellipsis operator, that is passed into both calls to quantile where dot, dot, dot is given as an argument. And the output then is an unnamed vector. This is advanced. If you don't understand what I just said, let's talk about it after. <laughs> you don't need to use ellipses. Okay, so using your function outputs. This is like all the other functions that we've been working with today. We're gonna do something on the right, we're using the assign operator and putting it in the object on the left. So if we do this function call, then our object out underscore 90, so we've assigned new values to low Q and high Q, and then it's giving us a 90% confidence interval. So this is how you can adjust those values. The defaults were to 95, but if you wanna use something different, you just pass those in as arguments. You can also display your output in some sort of meaningful context. So using this paste that I mentioned in the last one, this is going to take your values and stick them together into one string. So we can see a label and we can add the dash and that is a nice way of displaying your data. You could also do that within the function and pass it out as a string as well if you wanted to do that. Okay, I kind of covered a lot of this. Quick summary, if, 
function shares a name with a function already in the environment, it's going to be overwritten. The one in the environment will be overwritten. Arguments without default values are required to run a function. Arguments with defaults will use the default unless you explicitly give new values for those. Ellipses can pass additional arguments to internal function calls. And any object that's created within the function will not be accessed outside of the function unless you return it. And then finally, comments and meaningful variable names are the best way to ensure functions can be reused, interpreted, and just good practice for coding. Okay, so those functions. Now we're gonna change topics and go to loops. So in programming, a loop means a process which is repeated a certain number of times or until some condition is met. In uh, R, they well, in a lot of languages, they call these for loops if it's a number of times to be repeated, or it's called a while loop if it's waiting for some condition to be met. We're not going to discuss while. It's not really used a ton in analysis, but it is available in R. There may be certain instances where you want to use a while loop, but we're going to start with for loops today because they're a little easier to understand. And it will give you a good foundation to understand while loops if you want to use them in the future. So here is the anatomy of a for loop. We have our function call for. We're going to create a new variable, which is our loop counter. We're going to call it i. That's a very common index to use for these. And we're going to say in one to some n. So this is the number of times we're going to go through the loops, the sequence for the loop. And then within curly brackets, we have some operation. So let me show you what this means more explicitly. OK, print. We'll print a string to console. The for loop i in 10 to 1 is going to be a loop that's run 10 times. Within each iteration of the loop, we're going to print the value of i. And then after the loop is done, we're going to print blast off. Does anyone want to say out loud what this is going to output to the console? NASA nerds, now's your moment. Nobody. Ignition sequence 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Blast off. We did it. OK, very trivial example that shows you how it works. Here's a different example. I stole this from the R Wikipedia page. It's super long, but it's got a lot of really good content. If you want to learn more about any of the topics we're talking about today, I would actually recommend looking at the Wikipedia page for R. It's pretty cool. So executing a code in a for loop. So we're going to create a character vector with three objects. It is the words 1, 2, and 3. We're going to loop from 1 to the length of vector. The length of vector is 3. There are three items in vector. Within each iteration, it's going to check, is the element i of the vector equal to 1 in words? If it is, replace 1 character with the number 1. And then it's done. Go out of the loop, message, replace vector, print. OK. So this is an example also of another conditional statement. I showed if else earlier. That's used inside mutate summarize. Here we're saying run the line of code if it's true. So everything within the curly brackets, this curly bracket and this curly bracket will be run if that condition is true. So only if element i of the vector is equal to one will it be replaced with one. So this will then give us a vector, number one as the first element, character two as the second, character three as the third. Now, why did I go through all that? You don't need to do that for every uh, operation that you want to do in R. There's something called vector calculations in R. You don't need to use loops for a lot of things. 
So here we can see the same code rewritten without a loop. Why does this work? Because R is built in such a way that it will apply a function to either a scalar or a vector. I mentioned that earlier when we were talking about functions. We can use the same logical uh, conditional statement to select parts of the vector and reassign where it's true and print it. So all this to say, for loops exist in R, for loops exist in a lot of other programming languages, you don't need to use a for loop all the time in R. And I'll try and explain when you need to use it in R, but I think thinking about applying an operation to a vector is, if that's all you're trying to do, you probably don't need a for loop. So I'll try and go into that a little bit more explicitly in the next couple slides. If you have any experience with R, you may have heard of the apply functions. Apply is how base R implements for loops. You can use the for syntax that I just showed in R. They recommend that you use apply because it runs faster than a for loop because of how R is implemented. I think apply functions are super confusing and I never could wrap my head around them. There's a bunch of different flavors, L apply, T apply, S apply. What do they mean? I don't know. So these exist, but there's an easier way. And I would like to show you the way. It's called the map function. So this is another tidyverse function. It comes from the per package. And this is the tidyverse's way of implementing for loops. And this is how I would recommend you think about applying loops in your code. So I have the same coloring here to just show you. We have a function call. It's now called map. The loop sequence is the first argument here. So we still want to go from 1 to n. And then the second argument is the function. And we're going to still use that loop counter variable i and do some operation within there. So it's doing the same thing. Syntax is a little different. But it's going to run quicker than a for loop. And so it's a, it's a good pattern to wrap your head around. So how do we translate what we did in the previous for loop to map? So we can have our vector created, vec. I'm going to write a function and use this conditional statement, if else. So if i equals 1, O-N-E, then return the number 1 in quotes. Else, return the value of i. So that's, that's the function. So then we can use map and map the function across the vector. So remember, the, what you're mapping across is on the left. The function that you're applying is on the right. And so our output here is 1, 2, 3. You'll notice this output is a little different from what's been shown previously. This is returning a list. That is what map returns by default. There's a bunch of helper functions that will automatically typecast your output for you so it comes out in the format that you want to see. The default is list. One of those helper functions, map underscore chr. So this will automatically typecast the output to character and return it as a character string. You can look in the help documentation for map and it will list all of these helper functions. You can also do it manually afterwards. That's fine too. You know, there's no wrong way. There, nah, there's no 100% correct way to code. You can do it. You can do it a lot of different ways. It'll get you to the same point. Okay. So now here I'm, rather than creating a named function, like I did in the previous slide, so I called it replace one and then place that as the second argument in map on the previous slide. Now I'm doing what's called an anonymous function. So an anonymous function is unnamed. You're just creating it on the fly. And I just say, function of i, do the same steps. And it will, the output class is now character. If we print out to the screen, it will print our three characters. The benefits of using an anonymous function, maybe there are none. You know, you, 
Maybe you don't want to create a bunch of different functions in your environment and load them in. Uh, so you just do a bunch of anonymous functions. I, if you're doing a very simple change, one, cha one line code change like this, that's probably a case where you'd want to do an anonymous function. If you have multiple steps, you probably want to save it as a function that you can then call and reuse over and over. You know, thinking about taking chunks of code that you're going to reuse in the future. If you want to reuse it, save it as an object or a function and use it later on. OK. So here's a more realistic example of using a function and doing some looping over it. So I'm going to simulate a trial arm. I want to pass in the name of the arm as the first argument x. We're going to have a second argument, number of subjects that defaults to four. I'm going to save the arm as a column. I'm going to create individual IDs for the number of subjects. And then we're going to use some function that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes to fill dose mail weight. And then I'm going to return that data frame from the function. So dose arm one, I'm going to call our function, pass a one in, so our, our arm is one, and the return value that we get is all values one. We have four IDs. We have different doses that were assigned to the doses. We have different sexes. We have different weights. Now, we want to use this. Let's simulate multiple arms. Let's map over three. Let's do three different arms. So we're going to take our function that's named. We're going to map across it. We're going to do map underscore df. This will typecast to a data frame and return a single data frame where all of the outputs have been stacked on top of each other. So we have arm one, there are the first four rows, arm two, the next four, arm three, the last four rows. So we have simulated a clinical trial population. It's that easy. But wait, I ran the function again and I get a different result. We want to have reproducible code. Our results here aren't reproducible because I have introduced stochastic Meth functions into the uh, function that I'm calling. So let's talk about how R deals with stochasticity. A random number generator is used to any time that there is a stochastic function call in R. It will, there's some random number generator that is floating around whenever you're in R. And when you make a call, it will pull a number and give you a random value based on that. OK. You can set the seed for that random number generator. And this is how we make reproducible results. So you give it some number and say, the random number that I want to use next is 1. And it will use that. And then every time you run your code, as long as you do set seed 1 and then run your stochastic function, it's going to give you the exact same result because you're setting that random number generator next value explicitly. So some examples. Yeah, go ahead. It's still random, but you're saying start at this number and then pick, pick, a ran pick random values based on, on that initial seed. Uh, yeah. I don't know. Anybody else want to take a stab at this one? <laughs> Yeah, there's... You guys want to use the microphone for the people who are online so they can, can hear? Yeah. And maybe Mike, just repeat what you said because I think that was really good. I can't remember what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I think... Uh, uh... Every every it's just telling the the algorithm to start in the same place every time you run the code. So if if you run it run the code over and over without a seed, the algorithm is going to start in different places and give you a, a different sequence of random numbers. 
if you set the seed, it's going to give you the same sequence every time. It's still a string of random numbers. It's just the same string of random numbers so that when you run this code six months from now, you can duplicate your results. Okay. Oh, thanks. Okay, so here's some example functions that use stochasticity in R. Sampling from a uniform distribution, sampling from a normal distribution, sampling from an R object. These are all instances where you want random values to be produced. And I would say whenever you are calling something that has randomness in it, make sure to set your seed before doing it. Okay, so now why were we getting different results when I was simulating the trial twice? Well, it's because I was using these stochastic functions to generate. So for the dose, I was randomly sampling from the three options with replacement. I was doing a uniform distribution to determine what the sex was and a normal distribution to determine what the weight was. So this is why the results were different because I had stochasticity in the function. So we are going to set our seed to one, two, three. We're going to simulate three arms of the trial twice. And now we get identical results on the left and right hand sides. So this is how we're going to make reproducible code that you is still still has random numbers in it, but we can reproduce those random numbers. Okay, last thing that I want to talk about is these anonymous functions. So there is the tilde operator, and this is equivalent to saying function of dot x. So I use this a lot if I just want to change like one argument in a function when I'm mapping across it. So we're calling the sim trial, but now I want six subjects instead of the default of four. Rather than writing a new function that has six as the default, you can use this tilde and just say, I wanna change the argument number of subjects to six, uh, but then dot x is the what would have gone in as that argument uh, on the previous slide. So on the, on the left hand side where you have sequence one, two, three, so it's passing one, two, three into the first argument for that sim trial arm. Here we're just saying dot x. So it's equivalent to having function dot x. You may not use this, it's here if, if you find it useful, okay. So we have 20 minutes left exactly. I'm gonna say, let's spend 10 minutes on this, trying to do the hands-on. I'll go through it quick at the end, and then we can probably not gonna have a ton of time for Q and A. So if, does anybody have any like, if you have a specific question for me or the TAs that's not related to this hands-on, come and find us right now, and we can, we can talk through that, okay? So we'll spend 10 minutes on, this now, we're gonna use our MadnonMem data set again, write a little summary function, apply it, pivot the data, and then we can use map to create a list of plots as well as the challenge. If, you, if you're more interested in the map, start with the challenge. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll go through the solutions. Also send out the solutions to all of these today at the end of the, the talk. For three. Um, I answered that. I answered that. Can we see the ID on hover? I assume this was for the plotting. Yeah, not not by default. I think there's maybe some some ways that you can, but not that's not a not how it's commonly doing it. But there are, I think there are ways to do that if it's interactive. I don't know off the top of my head though. Oh, yeah, do you wanna, we have a, we have an expert online. I'm not an expert and I haven't used that in a while, so don't <laughs> take it to the bank. But Plotly, I think is the R package that allows you to create interactive plots if you wanna use that hover function. Thank you. Look that up, Google Drop it. in the chat. Library. Oh, poorly. Thank you. Autocorrect. P L O T L Y. Here we go.
okay, I hate to cut short anyone who's making some progress, but in the sake of time we're running out, I'm going to go through the solutions that I have right now. So let me share my R session. Let me open hands-on for solution. I'm going to restart my R, clear out everything from the previous R. Okay, so I'm going to run top chunk, import the libraries, import the data. Now we've written a summary function. We're going to paste together, passing in x. We're going to take the mean of x. We're going to round it to one decimal place. That's our first argument in paste. Then we're going to put a square bracket. We're going to calculate the fifth percentile. We're going to round it to one decimal place. That's the next argument for paste. And we're going to put a comma between. We're going to calculate the 95th percentile, round it to one decimal place, and add a square bracket on the end. So this function looks like this, 1, 2, 50. The summary, our mean value is 25 and a half. We have brackets, 5th percentile, 95th percentile, separated by a comma. That is how I implemented that function. If you did it differently, that's fine. If you did not round, that's fine. OK. Now, we want to apply the function across covariates. So I had a list of covariates we wanted to calculate this summary for. And we want to calculate it by dose group. First thing we're going to do is this group by ID, slice one, ungroup. Again, this pattern is used to only keep the first row for each subject in your data set. So we're collapsing it down one row per subject. After ungrouping, we're going to create a new group. We're going to pivot group by dose, and we are going to use the summarize function and calculate my summary for each of the named variables. So if I run this chunk of code, the output looks like this. Column for dose, column for weight, age, EGFR, and Billy, and then a row for each of the dose groups, and then the variables summary value uh, within that row. This is long, long to look at. If I'm being honest, I added this pivot in here because it didn't fit on my slide and I thought it looked bad. So we're gonna pivot longer. So from weight to Billy. So if we look at this output right now, from weight to Billy, we're gonna pivot longer. Pivot longer assumes anything that's not being pivoted is an ID column. So I don't need to say ID equals dose. It's just going to assume that anything not stated to pivot longer is an ID column. So now, we get this nice long table. We've pivoted longer. So we have the for 0 0.5 milligram dose. For the weight, here is the summary. For age, here is the summary. We've pivoted it longer. That's, that's how I would apply the same function to each of those covariates. Now, in advanced implementation, what did Sam say earlier? Don't copy paste your code. So. I copy pasted this line four times and then I just changed what covariate was being used. I don't want to do that. So here's a new function that we haven't talked about yet, but I'm introducing it to you now. You can learn about it as you continue your R journey after we conclude today. So this is called across. So I want to apply across these four variables the function named my sum. And I'm going to pivot longer. And that gives us the exact same output. It's just syntax that they use to apply across multiple columns. OK, I don't even remember. What was my challenge? Challenge was use map to create a list of individual concentration time plots. Cool. So we learned how to create ggplots. So we're going to take our dat. We're going to do a distinct. On all the IDs, I just want the IDs listed. I'm going to use pull 
Pull is a function that essentially typecasts from data frame to a vector. So the output that I get is a character vector, or sorry, a numeric vector with all of the unique subjects listed. Now I want to create a plotting function. I'm going to call it PK profile. It's going to take the data as the only argument, and then it's going to use the aesthetics time on the X, EV on the Y. We're going to group by ID. We're going to add some labels, points and lines, and log 10. OK, so we're going to load that. So now we have a function in our, our environment named PK profile that creates this ggplot object. Now, I want to map. So I'm going to use map. I'm going to map over subjects. Subjects, again, is that vector of all of the subject IDs in my data set that I created. I'm going to use an anonymous function here. I'm going to take dat. I'm going to filter so just the ID is equal to the current value of subject on this iteration. So on the first iteration of this loop, dot x will be equal to 1. On the second iteration of this loop, dot x will be equal to 2. So we're filtering down just to that unique subject for each iteration. And then I want to call my function PK profile, and I will assign the output to a variable named p, short for plot. OK. So if you, if you just type p into the console, it's going to return every plot and put them into your viewer. And then you can use these little arrows to scroll through them and look at all the different plots that you have. Kind of cumbersome. I just want to look at one. So you can, this is a list. So you can use these double brackets and say, I would like to look at the first element of P. And we'll print it out to your plots output. This is how we take this list of plots that's given to us. We can look at parts of it. You can pass this. I didn't talk about how we save these plots out. You can save it as a PNG, a JPEG. You can do all sorts of stuff with it once you have it created. There's ways that you can stack the plots on top of each other and create those nice figures where A, B, C, D, you have different plots showing different stuff. This can all be done in R. It's a rabbit hole. But, you, but there's a lot of flexibility. There's a really great community online, and they'll tell you how to do whatever you want to do. Just got to Google. Yeah. Can you reuse the little function to make the plots in the same page? Use which one? The function? Loop, loop function. A loop function to put them on the same page. The all the plots in the same. You, so you wouldn't have to use plot, use loop in that instance. You, so how I would do that would be, if this works, PK profile. I want to use dat as my data. And then I'm going to facet by my ID. Will it work? Sure does. Cool. So again. Great question. I mentioned earlier, you don't need to use loops for a lot of things in R because it will use these vector calculations. This is an instance of that where you don't need to use a loop. You just say, do it on everything, and here's what we get. Yeah, thank you. OK. Wrapping up, I have two slides, and then you guys can never hear my voice again. Promise. No, I don't promise. You probably will hear my voice again. OK. Solutions, solution. OK. You learned R today. Wasn't it great? What's the next step? Let me tell you. Your friends at Metrum Research Group have all sorts of material for you to explore. Please go to our website, metrumrg.com slash metrum hyphen expo. What's in the expo, you ask? Well, let me tell you. We have generated or we have created many R packages that we use throughout our data analysis workflow. Here on this website, you will find how we use each of these packages to conduct POPPK analyses, how we are generating our tables, our figures, reports, interacting with non-MEM, building data sets, summarizing data sets, you name it, it's there. 
So check it out. That's the next step. Also, you know, I think I covered a ton of material today. And just think about what data you have available and what you could try to do with what you learned today. And just try and apply it. You know, the best way to learn this stuff is to just play with it and learn from your mistakes, Google everything, use the cheat sheets. It's all, it's all there. Uh, I've also sent you guys too many emails already, and now you have my email. So feel free to contact me directly if you have a question, and I'm happy to answer. And here are a couple additional resources as well that I have found useful in my R learning journey. We don't have time for a Q&A session, but thank you for your attention and letting me be here today. I'm going to email an R script with all the solutions. Does that work for people? And then you can just run it. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sam. It was a, a great um, learning opportunity. And I know I learned some new things, too, in using R. So we're looking forward to everyone using R and Quarto now. So we will have very clean codes and organized uh, documentation. So, um, all right, great. Thank you everyone for sticking with us through the day. Thanks to those who have joined online um, and to all of our speakers and sponsors.